Today we're speaking with filmmaker, vegan advocate and the 21st Lord of Donsaini, Randall Plunkett. Currently, he's also supporting Hearthstone Veganic Sanctuary in their efforts to expand their land and begin their own rewilding project. This is Animal Rebellion in conversation with Randall Plunkett. Hi, I'm Lorna Ann. Hi, I'm Juliana. How are you? Nice to meet you and thank you for having me. Thank you so much for your time. We really, really appreciate it. As you know, we already know quite a bit about your rewilding work in Dunsany Estate where you live. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so starting with a bit of history about Dunsany. Dunsany is quite a large estate, if not one of the biggest estates in the country. My family came with the Normans. So we've been here quite a while. We're actually the oldest family still associated with one place. We've always been a kind of cornerstone of agriculture because even during the era of Horace Plunkett, he had invested a lot of money in some of the most sophisticated farming tools of the time. In our farmyard still has a lot of the relics of back that time. So uh, Dunsany was commonly associated as a big agricultural place, you know, and it's prime me land. The estate is about 1,700 acres, of which about 500 acres is forestry. Now, most of that forestry would be native broadleaf mixed with beech and stuff like that. Little bit of it was plantations from the 50s. So there's a little bit of sort of Douglas fir and stuff like that mixed into our current woodlands. But none of it has ever been harvested. So it's not exactly what you see in Kerry or, or uh, you know, the the West, basically, where it's all like spruce everywhere. There's a constantly fixing holes and things like that. And trust me, living in a castle is as wonderful as it sounds. In practice, it's quite a lot of work. So money is always an issue. So like when I took over, the first sort of idea was how do I monetize this? How do I make this work? The original idea was organic farming. Now, back then I ate meat and I was a, a what I would call meathead. If you talk to me about vegetables, I'd say, yeah, with my steak. And then, you know, I tried the, the normal agriculture for a while. It didn't really take, I didn't like the cruelty side to it because, I mean, the first time I bought cattle, they came with their heads bleeding because they had dehorned them. Now, I never seen anything so rough. Now, as a guy who makes horror movies, I can tell you that was like a horror movie. And uh, looking at these creatures that uh, had blood coming out of their heads and me sitting there kind of like looking after their horns, you know, that, that doesn't leave you very well. I'm used to uh, fictional blood, but when I see a creature who's suffering, that was not cool. So that didn't do well for me. And then the more I tried to, to, to make that sort of thing work for me, it didn't really work. And then financially on top, it was a lot of work and got little to no money out of it. So, you know, after the year or so of that, I finally said, this isn't going to work. So at the time, the environment was pretty bleak. I saw the land was getting quite tired, you know, because overgrazing and over farming is probably one of the biggest problems we have in Ireland today. And uh, animal agriculture is probably the worst because apart from the chemicals that they inject the animals with the cruelty side to it, it's also extremely, extremely hard on land. Land never has a chance to recover. There's never any regeneration or anything like that. And I was always curious about that. How does land stay healthy if there's never the if it's the cycle of life is never followed you're constantly overgrazing there's never any time for things to recover and then on top of that they cut hay to feed the cattle on top so so there's never anything going back into the soil so it's is it so surprising that we have to keep injecting the soil with lots of chemicals so that never stuck well with me and i got some generic should we say old geezer uh intellect which was oh sure sure the fertilizer does that Okay, fair enough. Didn't really believe that, but okay, I'll, I'll buy that. But then I was making a movie and a lot of these things were on my mind and, and you have to understand what I do for a living. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a filmmaker. So you, I suppose you heard the term method acting, the idea where an actor will become the, the part they're playing to live with that person and thus perform better. I do something similar with my process. I do it with writing. So I start to study things. I obsess about things and then I start doing things. And one of the th themes that I was very interested in was environmental destruction and how the planet would have its revenge on us to wipe us out. And then what would happen afterwards? So these things were floating in my mind a lot. And I thought I couldn't really get into the idea without sort of seeing what would happen. So I removed all the animal agriculture. I had to make a bunch of excuses and, and I got to pretend to be a diva that I have to have my process, managed to get the animals off the, off the land and I was very happy. And I was thinking to myself, it's like, you know, at least I don't have to look at, at sheep screaming 
because when they take the, the babies away, that is the most traumatic sound I ever heard. So I started living with the land a little bit, thinking that at least for nothing else, it's going to recover for a while. And it did. Uh, actually, the first thing that happened was weeds galore. I had nothing but thistles and, and ragwort and nettles and all the stuff that farmers tell you, oh, my God, it's dangerous. You're ruining your land. And I was thinking about this. And I said, well, I don't want to spray any chemicals. I don't like pesticides. I mean, the concept of just spraying poison on land just is mental. First year, things looked good, but nothing much changed. Second year, I started seeing a lot more uh, dandelions and thistles and all that stuff and a lot of ragwort. And my mom was given out to me saying, you know, we're going to get into trouble with the council and they're going to start fining us, which is always the fear for landowners whenever you see those things. So I started, I wasn't willing to compromise on my spraying. So I started pulling and that was a feckin' disaster because the more I pulled, the more they came back. And so I made a calculation that for me to make any real dent and bear in mind, this was more than 300 acres of grassland. Now we're talking. So for me to make any real dent, I would have to like pull at least 50 a day. Well, I'm really shitty at maths because 50 a day was nowhere near the number I needed. So that didn't work. By year three, it was like pretty heavy. By year four, it was completely, it was declining quite a bit. Think about year three, year four. Year five, it declined a lot. And there was almost hardly any of it left in the front field. And there was a bit of it in the back field. And what had happened is it started accumulating in areas. We'd start seeing what used to be yellow flowers everywhere suddenly started having other things, wild flowers, different types of grass. I started seeing insects increase in numbers every year consistently. I roughly estimate that it's about 30% increase yearly at this point. Bees everywhere, butterflies everywhere, spiders everywhere. And then I started rehoming animals as well because I thought to myself, like, I made a sort of like an eco protection area here. And it was at that time I was calling it nature conservation because rewilding wasn't really a word back then. I think it existed on the fringe, but it certainly wasn't a mainstream word. So what happened was, is, uh, yeah, as time went on, the movie never got made, but I began to really realize, and this was about the same time that I turned vegan because, to be honest with you, even as a meat eater, I kind of could tell that the modern westernized concept of you need meat to survive, it was bullshit. I mean, even a meat eater, I could tell you that was nonsense because it didn't make sense to me, even genetically speaking. Um, the environment was, I could see it with my own two eyes that it was not good for what I was looking at. I was looking at what they were doing to like the waterways and stuff and all that silage just getting into everything. And I thought that there's no way this is natural. That and on top of that, you know, if I didn't flavor my meat with herbs, it didn't even taste good. So, you know, I mean, I looked at my dog and my dog was eating meat and he didn't seem to care whether there was salt in it or pepper or anything like that. And I tried to eat a bit of meat and it was the most boring thing. I needed hot sauce. So you, you, you go to your instincts and my instincts were telling me that meat's probably not very good for you. And then I started seeing the science behind it and all the environmental stuff. And I realized that absolutely uh, the only way to go forward would be to be vegan immediately. So I didn't do the transitional thing where I went, oh, well, I think I'll try getting rid of fish. No, meat's not good for you. The science is there. Right. I was eating steak on Monday. I'm eating tofu on Tuesday. And that was it. And I haven't broken it since. And then how can you possibly want to be a vegan and profiteer out of like, animal suffering, I found that to be a problem for me. It was all or nothing. And so I decided no more animals ever again, rewilding all the way. What I seen with all the animals returning was absolutely, I was seeing it with my own eyes changing and more animals coming back. And I was looking around at all these crazy farmers. It's like somebody lifted the veil and suddenly all I could see was the problems in everything. And then I saw all the solutions right there in front of me. And so the rewilding, I call it rewilding now, but the conservation evolved into beyond something that was coming from a film into something that I needed. And it was funny because it was my career that pushed me in that direction or led me to think about these concepts that ended up basically redirecting my life. And now look, I'm seven years vegan, seven years or so of rewilding, I think this year. And, uh, you know, I know I'm right. I can't prove it yet. I'm slowly trying to build the science so I can prove to other people and then shape from within. That's kind of how I feel. We know that you've had experiences, well, challenging experiences with hunters. 
um, in your oh, area. Yeah. So oh, yeah. you hear a bit about that um, and some of the challenges you faced from the work that you've done. Well, let me put it like this. When I took charge of Dunsany, we had gunshots going off every weekend. There were people on the land. We, we, you have to understand that County Mead is a, is a hunting center. Everybody calls me a, a West Brit, ironically. And there they are on ponies wearing the, basically the, the armor of, of oppression mm -hmm. in Ireland, which is those red jackets, you know, because that, that, whole, that whole thing was a way to oppress the Irish people. From day one, we've always had problems with hunts. We have four different hunts and they literally are surrounding us. You know, my neighboring farms are all like where they, the kennels are. So we were having problems during hunting season, there would be bullets flying past. I mean, we had a window shot out. We had um, regular um, gunshots near the house. So, you know, at first, we would call the police, we'd throw them out, we'd send them annoying letters. Of course, these guys just, they don't care. And they sort of can do all their, what they want with without any kind of problems with the law. And so if they're gonna hunt every weekend, well, then I'm gonna patrol every weekend, I'm gonna stop them. And if they're gonna suddenly start coming in the week, well, I'm gonna come on the week. And if they're gonna be there at dawn, well, I'll be there at dawn. So I started patrolling my land every single night and especially during hunting season so that's from september till about march every night seven days a week i was there driving and the time that they tend to shoot deer and stuff like that tends to be in the evening times so i would typically clock about two to three hours in my car just circling my estate with binoculars and the first year i think there was upwards of 50 calls to the police on hunters and poachers and dodgy vehicles the second year was i think 40 Third year was somewhere in the upper 30s. Fourth year was about the same. Last year, I think, was a bit less. Was a, Sorry, last year, as in the year before COVID, was about 29. COVID, three, four calls. This year, nothing yet. So I managed to curb it. Now, at the same time, like I was relentless and I started um, really getting in the face of these people. And as for the actual hunt on horses, you know, I started having people hand me their, their schedules and I started turning up and following them around and, and making them feel uncomfortable. I would videotape them. I would do all the stuff that they wouldn't like. And look, people threatened to, to, to burn me out of my house, to, to kill me, to beat me up. I got too worried because my car was so recognizable that I can't park my car around my estate because they'll slash the tires. I've had every sign in my estate yanked down. I've had uh, my, my no hunting sign shot at. I have to regularly change padlocks on my estate probably once a month because people are putting glue in the locks. I press charges on numerous hunts. I've even gone for injunctions, uh, threatened injunctions with some of these hunts. And I've got one crew who, you know, like I said, were stupid enough to actually write on the line about how they were gonna stick my head on a stick and they were gonna set fire to my house. And I pushed that to the police. And of course the police, well, let's just say I gave that to them more than a year and a half ago. I'm still waiting for my prosecution. And cause I'm, you know, I'm like a dog with a bone. You know, I'm not the type of person who says, oh, well, I'll let it go. No, if they wanna be relentless, I'll be relentless. And that's kind of how I started doing it. And you know what, for all the faults and all the stuff and fights I curbed, poaching greatly. We have very little poaching. Now it does happen. And every year you have to be vigilant, but it has come down so much. And, you know, I got to know these people, you know, I tried diplomacy. Diplomacy doesn't work with these people because they think that they're better than everybody and they torture animals for a living or for an enjoyment. So what do you, how do you deal with that? You know, um, there is something to be said if you're living on in a situation where you have to kill to eat. But this is not Ireland. We have Tesco's. Uh, Little has a great fruit and vegetable side of the market, which, which food comes, I can get avocados all year round. And whether you feel that that's a good thing or a bad thing, the truth of the matter is, is that we have alternatives. And on top of that, the science doesn't even make sense to eating those kinds of things. So we are in a better situation. There's no reason for us to hunt, except for to, to satisfy a sort of perverse part of our character which shouldn't be, which shouldn't be, you know, even stimulated. We should be trying to evolve to a better thing because the days of hunter gatherer are over.
we have agriculture, we have science, we should be trying to embrace something better. And we are talking about a fair society. How can one really try and, and, and give people equality if we can't even have equality or, or, or respect for the creatures that inhabit our planet with us? It's, it's sort of ridiculous when people talk to me about people being equal and, and having compassion for people when we can't even have compassion for the environment around us. You can't do one without the other. So I think if we want to evolve into a greater species, which I believe we can do, we have to leave our, our prehistoric ideas behind and embrace something that's better. People often say to me, oh, but it's our nature. It's like, bullshit is our nature. We, this is taught. This is what we've had to do for survival. And unfortunately, it has become not about survival. It has become more about something else. And that's the problem with the world today. We will never get past the problems of the world today until we can sort of leave that behind and say, we are now humans 2.0. I hear you talking and I can see that obviously there has been a very long learning process. Now you are gonna collaborate with Hearthstone Santory. How are you gonna bring all that knowledge, all those things that you have learned? And can you tell us a bit of the project that you are working with, Mia? So Hearthstone Sanctuary, we should say, Dunsany is not essentially a sanctuary. I should point that out. There was a concept at one point that I thought about doing a sanctuary. And I thought to myself, yeah, that, that definitely should be done. Uh, the problem was when I looked at things at a, at a long-term point of view, I thought to myself, like, there are sanctuaries around. There's nowhere near enough of them, and there's nowhere near enough money for them, most importantly. But the while there was nothing, I think there is no, and, and the national parks, it's, you know, it's a different thing. Those are parks. They're not wild. And I'm not saying that my bit is wild either, but it's the closest thing to it. You know, there's no bins and there's no public toilets, you know, and we let things rot as they as they fall. I don't have to have all that stuff. So the problem is, is that I've created something that I felt was lacking in Ireland, particularly there wasn't and there was nobody else who had land or I would say the means to create what I was going to create. So that's why I started that. Now, the problem was I couldn't get past the idea that I still wanted to save things. So I started helping with releasing animals and we met um nia and uh and she was very supportive of my work and and i got really into heartstone i started following it on instagram and then i got a call from her and she asked me whether i would get more directly involved to which i said yes because the pr truth of the matter is the hardest part it's not someone like me who makes the big change because a guy like me has a bit more means than everybody else but the truth of the matter is what makes change are, are all these smaller places who are doing it who work every day like hearthstone i mean there's no money there there's nothing but sacrifice it's struggle every single day so when i when i speak to her i'm sort of i'm inspired because you know what here's someone who didn't have the benefits that i had who's fighting every single day to protect animals who do not have a voice in our society to uplift not to destroy you know for me that's very inspiring and that's direct action you know and the thing is is that i have a little bit of a platform and i'm hoping that anything that i get from what i'm doing you try and spread it as much as possible because look there's lots of places doing what we're doing and hearthstone for me just it's the the one that i have closest to my heart because i feel the most engaged and I even have a little a little cow there that I got to name. So I'm super into that, you know. And the truth is, it's it's very pure, you know. And, and the thing is, I feel as, as someone who spent a large time consuming and, you know, not giving a damn, just interested in myself, you know, indulging in things that really are based in, in cruelty. And as I get older, as I see the things around me and I, I look to the future and I look at these things, I mean, how could I not really want to change the world I live in, you know, and, and money is, is paper. It means nothing. You know, if we don't have an environment, if we don't have, you know, if we don't have our, our ideals to live by, then we are just exactly what everybody says. We're just animals. And I don't think we are. I think we, we are, we are an evolution. And I think we should be the ones empowering our environment, not destroying it. But I think that that's not an easy thing to do. It's always e easy to take the, the simple road. But the higher road, it's harder. But I do feel that in the end, it, it bears the most fruit. Right. I carried out a fundraising to buy a, big, a bigger piece of land. And can you tell us about the plans that you have for that land? 
I think the most important thing with sanctuaries is support. And support comes in three different ways. One is, is promoting the concept of protecting wildlife and, and especially animals who don't have a say. Because to be honest, if we all went vegan tomorrow, we'd have an, uh, basically, we'd have to destroy all these animals, right? And I'm not saying, don't get me wrong. I would like to see us transitioning away from this kind of barbaric thing. And this is where sanctuaries come in, because as time goes on, we might see more and more farmers turning into sanctuaries, and that needs to be encouraged. And this is what the, the reason why I think I never went vegan earlier, because I'd have people who are trying to judge me, who point their finger and say, no, you're wrong. This is what, and that, I never heard that. You know, I'd listen to it and be like, ah, go eat some protein, you know, but it's not what conquered me was someone pointing their finger. What conquered me was them giving me logic giving me science and giving me an, a way out. Because I think fundamentally everybody knows, I mean, you might not be willing to admit it, but everybody knows that what we're doing is bad. I knew, I wasn't willing to accept it. I was worried about how it, my life would be. And this is, I think the same with animal agriculture. I mean, there's environmental destruction. They're cutting down the rainforest they, you know, and people say, oh, but it's for soya. Yeah, but that soya doesn't go to us. That goes to the cattle. And that's and how much water is left? Well, let's let's be serious here. We're destroying all our water supplies. For us to really transition, we will need sanctuaries. And sanctuaries like Hearthstone are, are the, on the they're basically on the front line. And so, you know, they can only do so much. And we are gonna have massive casualties in the future with with losses with both human and animal. And we just need to open up as much to take in as many as we can. But there, there's a there's a fine line between trying to save and then putting animals in a position where they're not living well. You know, animals need to roam. They need to have habitat. They need to have uh, companionship. They need to be able to mate. They need to be able to, in, you know, because there is there is emotion there and psychology as well. You know, anyone who's spent any significant amount of time with an animal knows that they aren't simple creatures. You know, even the most simplistic, even a chicken has feelings, has emotions, it has companionship. So we have to kind of prepare ourselves to kind of like phase things out and part of that is creating areas where these animals can go and be part of society in, in, a, in a greater sense and i mean that is in a natural society i don't mean that we have to go on the bus with the chicken but we do need to have that stuff and we're seeing it already people are, are pushing away from the old ideals i mean more and more i myself became vegan and i never thought i would be vegan and off the back of me i've convinced at least seven or eight people to become vegan and, and, you know, and now here I am talking about veganism. It comes from encouragement. It comes from transitioning people away. Hearthstone is an example, and I'm hoping that many people will follow it and we'll start seeing more sanctuaries. We should have a sanctuary in every county, you know, and, and that's part of, it's part of the rewilding is, is creating a, a, a better situation for us and the animals. I know you guys do a lot of reforesting there as well as like rewilding and different like techniques for farming crops and stuff. So what's your vision for it, for the place moving forward? I think Hearthstone is at its early stages. The biggest problem is financial. Um, so if there's any viewers or readers who are going to, you know, see this and be inspired, the money that, that is donated is, is spent directly on the animals. You know, I can, I, can, I can stand behind that statement. It covers basically Hearthstone's expenses. And Nia is a, like is a seven day a week person, you know what I mean? So it goes to the animals. So what we would like to see is an expansion, creating habitats, because that's how animals come back. That's how animals flourish. You see, the biggest problem we have today is that we're living in an unnatural world and big open fields with no hedgerows and no trees, you know, although it produces like a certain amount of steak, it's not a natural way. It, animals are more prone to disease, they're more prone to depression, you know? And the thing is, is I think habitat uh, creating habitats for these animals in maybe in the future, even something in the, in the regards to what they do at the Nepa state, where you have animals in free roam around a wild area could be certainly a more beneficial way of treating the animals and, and will prevent probably a lot of ailments. You know, I know that part of the biggest problem for things like sheep is that they sit in wet areas for long periods of time and they can't go up hills. They can't go up, you know, their habitats are so limited that they are prone to all sorts of diseases. Thus, you have to spend a fortune in vets. But if they were given sort of wider areas to go about, they would probably have less needs, if you know what I mean. So I think with, with Hearthstone, I think I'd like to see it expand. I would like to see more people maybe going to visit it 
and perhaps there can be a way of monetizing it in a way that it will benefit the work. Um, but I also feel that people need to be involved with it. At least, you know, they need to be able to see it and see that there's an alternative. And I think Hearthstone is a good example of how that could work. I'm hoping, I'm hoping in time we can expand it out. I'm hoping that that more people will want to copy that because that's what we really want. I think, I think we all want to see, you know, an evolution of, of what we're at now. And I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not going to say it past judgment on anyone who's not doing or doesn't believe in what I believe in, because I mean, if I did that, I would never have accepted myself. And uh, I think it just, it, it requires time and showing a bit of light onto, onto something and people to sort of think about it for a long period of time. And then you'll find that people go that way anyway. I mean, we're programmed that way, let's be honest. So just to end, Randall, can I ask you, how can people support your project there in Dancini and Hearthstone itself? Well, I would say at the moment, Hearthstone definitely needs the most support. So I would say certainly if you have a few extra coins, if you have a little extra time, you know, there are, it's not just about money. It's, it's about, it's about helping. It's about facilitating. It's about, you know, anything that can be done to benefit the animals, whether it's, it's donating some extra hay that you have, whether it's, it's, it's helping out on the farm, whether it's, it's, you know, it's, it's that it's direct action is, is always the best. And if, if you're not in a means to do that and you have just a few extra shekels in your pocket, throw a few shekels, but if you're not tell somebody else about it. Knowledge is power, and, and there's a lot of people with a lot of expertise who are, you know, can offer some benefit, even just from, from supporting, you know, on Facebook, on Instagram, because allowing the story of Hearthstone and the story of Dunsany to get to a bright, wider audience is the first step in creating ideas. People will probably start to come to a lot of the conclusions that we hope they will come to, and maybe that will ignite a bit of change. When can we come visit you in Dunsany? <laughs> <laughs> well, as soon as you guys are able to get out here, I would be happy to show you. Like if you come in the summer, the grass is like way high and then you see deer pop out and it's it's amazing. It sounds magical, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Well, it's you know what the problem is, is that he, we in Ireland deserve a lot more. You know, Dunsany, unfortunately, it's a jewel, but it should be the standard. I hate to say it. You know, I mean, the, the biggest problem is today is that it's, it seems so magical because we're so not used to that kind of thing. But you know, some of my biggest supporters are the old people who used to remember Ireland before the motorways and the trains and the and the concrete everywhere. We had a ranger here who used to control the deer when it first started, when I first took over, before I went vegan. And then, I, he, you know, unfortunately, he died during the lockdown. And I was speaking to his family and the family said to me, you know, he spent his whole career shooting things and controlling animals. And the last few years since he stayed at Dunsany and started getting involved with the rewilding, he said to his wife and his, his family, he's like, I spent my whole life killing things and now I just want things to live. Wow. That you know, cool. and that's the magic of what I'm talking about here. You know, it sounds, it's anyone who doesn't understand. I sound like a lunatic who, who lives in La La Land. But the truth is when you live and you see things blossom and come, you start to see the error in your ways. And that's the problem. I wasn't aware of it before. And it took time to get here. Don't get me wrong. I didn't, I didn't drop the red pill and just was like, whoa. It, it took time to get here. And but like any any sort of form of enlightenment, it's it's a journey. And I'm still learning every day. And and look, I'm not some egghead scientist, you know, I'm a hack filmmaker. So, you know, if it's if it was possible for me to find my way in this path i'm really hoping that in time loads of people will and then we can actually have a, a decent society you know we can live better i mean my my great great relative started the co-ops here and the women's association and even was involved with the credit union you know these are socialistic things that benefited the average person not the elite but he took a big chance and was very heavily penalized as a result of it and i i get that myself don't get me wrong it's a sacrifice but if someone like me isn't going to take initiative. How can I possibly ask someone else to take initiative, someone who doesn't have the means? It's a responsibility of people who are born into privilege to do something to further the, their, their home and their country. And I'm very proud of where I come from. Um, and I'm very proud of the people. But I also feel that it's, it's not about leading people. It's about showing people a possibility of something else or something better that I believe in. 
And that's what, what every person in my position should be thinking about before making decisions, because this isn't about me. It's not even about, about the next generation. It's about four generations from now. It's about what kind of world do we want to live in? And, and the thing is, is that if, you're, if people like myself aren't going to step up, then there's no point. I just can be here listening to you for hours. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, really, and for the work that you're doing. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad that you, you, you tolerated me for this, this interview. But listen, thank you so much. And spread the word, because I think this is good stuff that we're doing here. And uh, Ireland should be a leading country in this, you know, because our country is green, or at least it's supposed to be. So we should be doing it. Thank you so much. Thank you so, Thank much, you so much for the opportunity, guys. And listen, have a great weekend. You too.